Well, I'm going to get you uh, another angle on something because um, uh, actually President Obama gave us a hint about something and I says, well, I am definitely latching on to what he said here because, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of President Obama. Like, uh, don't be thinking, well, I'm cheering on President Obama. But, well, I know he's a president. I know that too. But, like, let me put it to you this way. Um, he stated that enjoy what's going on right now with energy prices because by next year it could be totally different. He says, in other words, if you have more money in your pocket to spend due to having lower energy costs this year, go buy yourself some goods that could maybe last you a long time with that money you know, for many years, whatever you need to be buying. I don't know whether it's a, you know, a toaster oven or whatever, you know. But that's what he actually advised. Now, that was not really broadcast too many places. And you're saying, well, why should I trust President Obama? Maybe they think that. But here's an age-old axiom. In other words, low oil, when commodities go too low, low oil prices or low, ex extra extraordinarily low commodity prices actually lead to high prices by creating a, um, well, a shortage because I know there's not going to be a shortage of oil in the earth, but you're always going to have to extract it. That's always the age-old prop, get it out of the ground, right? It's always there. The earth has plenty of oil. Now, I'm showing you a picture from the 1973 oil crisis. But the next type of oil, the next oil crisis is not actually going to be a matter of supply. It's going to be a matter of price. And the middle class is not going to be able to afford it. It sounds crazy today. But this is really how commodities throughout their whole economic history have always been considered high risk possibly high reward assets uh, in other words because they go up and down so so radically that low oil prices lead to lower um, capital expenditures for exploration and you know that's going on today in oil and what will happen is in the future that's going to actually create an oil crisis the oil is going to be in the ground, but since they shut down, they're already starting to uh, see, feel the effects greatly in the shale oil industry, and there's already been casualties. And I know Russia's oil even is, 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 not, a, is not cheap to uh, extract. Saudi's oil is cheap to extract. Uh, they have a very low cost of production. But Saudi is probably not going to be able to uh, keep up with demand for the entire earth at these prices and there's other factors that are going on that are extraordinary in the weather right now too so when we had this crisis back in the um, 1973 it also led to the stagflation of the mid 70s and it led to uh, extremely high gold and uh, silver and oil uh, prices and um, well, how it was corrected was when Paul Volcker came into office and he raised interest rates. Something that cannot be done today, because if they raise interest rates extraordinarily high, like Paul Volcker did back in 1980, uh, you know, he's the chairman of the Federal Reserve, what would happen is <laughs> they couldn't pay the, the debt service on the United States. They wouldn't be able to service the debt with interest rates like that. So when it goes up this time, it's going to stay up. And it's, what's going to happen is there's going to be devaluation of the dollar. How long this is going to take, that's really the whole damn question. It's also like how low can it go? How high can it go? When's it, when's it going to hit bottom? You know, nobody really knows these type of things. Actually, that's absolute truth. If people know the principles of what's going on. Now, as far as like in 73, there was no gas. This next oil crisis quote unquote there's going to be gas it's just that the price is going to be too high and where it's going to be felt the most is in the middle class who really you know today they really can't afford to buy new cars as much the way they used to there's not a strong middle class the wealthier class is the topper top several percent of society will just buy electric vehicles or hybrids and run them on electricity and buy solar panels for their houses and all that type of stuff but 
Uh, other people are not – see, even now it sounds ludicrous today because of the price drop. The price drop today is actually stopping all new capital expenditures for oil. It's like whatever's out there that is cheap enough to pump from the ground like in Saudi – that's that's where the, that's what they're going with, but it's killing the shale oil industry in the United States. It's also killing the Russian industry. Um, there's a little bit of an angle going on there besides uh, you know what even appears on the surface because I know that I said before it looks like they're trying to uh, uh, stop Russia from going into Ukraine and pu- uh, pu- and punish them by. Um, you know, bringing down the oil prices in, which causes them not to be able to have as, as much money for military expenditures. I know they've been trying to uh, revamp their military and, um, you know, in, in a more modern way versus just add to the military. And I, I've actually known this for decades. It's not, they've, they've, they have actually been concentrating more on high-tech weapons in secret than they have been on conventional forces. A lot of people... Well, that's been that's been uh, readings I've been done doing over the years in uh, military circles from way back. But uh, well, what could possibly happen though? There could actually be. You know, this is back during '73. Uh, they didn't even have enough gas to supply the gas stations. And they went out of business and they became uh, little like revival centers for Jesus saves and stuff. You know, but uh, you know, I don't know if it's going to come to that point. But the point is that. The energy crisis is going to come about due to high prices. Low oil, low energy prices, extremely low energy prices lead to high prices. Also, on the other side, and when they go too high and they spike up too high, it leads to demand destruction. Because what happens in everybody then who uh, will be buying electric cars or installing solar panels on their house, and eventually that technology will get out into everybody else and from there it'll create a destruction of of the demand for oil and actually probably permanently bring it down there's probably only one more super spike left in oil to tell you the truth this will probably be the last time it's really you know the next time it really super spikes probably will be the last time now, other things that are probably leading to a super spike in oil is um, the war drums. Now, I know uh, Soros has talked about arming the hell out of uh, Europe and trying to get Europe to stop Russia. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about, stop Russia? You know, I mean, I mean I'm not running the policy here. To me, it would just be Ukraine is independent and... Ukraine is has a hand, they have a hands off policy from NATO, Europe, and Russia, and Ukraine does its own thing, and it's like they just produce their own food and uh, they sell food to other nations that are the breadbasket of Europe, and they make money off of that, you know, and they they thrive and prosper. Um, that would be my policy, you know, but I'm not the, I am not the policy maker, but it seems to be that, you know, when they're pushing these extremely low oil prices, um, they're also pushing Russia over the brink where it's making Putin more aggressive. And you've seen where this is actually leading to, where he's uh, testing the air spaces of, you know, in, a, in the Baltic Sea, um, the over, you know, Scotland, the UK, Alaska, you know, more blusterous talk about, you know, Flying missions from Alaska to Florida, near Alaska to Florida in the U.S., and it may be the plan. It may be the plan to lead to conflict. Now, conflict definitely would send oil through the roof. Oil actually has always been the black gold in during times of conflict. That's the one super safe commodity to be in during times of conflict traditionally, until technologies change. Uh, but what could happen there? And see, that could actually that could actually send the price up a lot. And you know, I don't know what can possibly happen in the Middle East. You never know. Um, the king of Saudi is well. 
They said he was. They said he was going to die years ago. Now supposedly, you know, they said he was on his deathbed years ago. Now it's like, I think he's ninety years old. Supposedly he has not. He's uh, his pneumonia. But if he dies, there's going to be major political changes in the Middle East and in Saudi, and it could lead to a conflict in the area. A lot of people don't realize that, but once the king of Saudi does, you know, he's 90 now, and he's sick, and he's he was rushed to the hospital. I don't know if, you know, it, this has happened years ago. It's, I don't know, he could be around until he's over 100. I don't know. Yeah, I really don't know. But they do say that once he dies, it's going to create a power vacuum, and it can lead to a lot of internal strife within Saudi, you know, for uh, political power. And it could actually cause a lot of political turmoil in the Middle East. That could be. But when we have too low oil prices, it's not that we're going to have the same type of oil crisis. Price. We have too low oil prices, right? It's not going to lead to the same oil type of oil crisis as we had in 1973, where there, you know, there was a uh, shortage. Well of oil because of all the oil imports it's going to lead to high oil prices because nobody they're shutting down you know some of the some of the um, shale oil industries are actually going under Texas is actually having conniptions over these freaking oil prices and I know it's even hurt I know it's hurting Russia it's hurting a lot of different areas it's hurting Venezuela Venezuela is probably going to have a regime change here pretty soon They've they've had you know the major devaluations in the boulevard. Oh, also in Russia, the Fitch has just downgraded Russia's uh, debt or, or uh, uh, bonds or whatever it was just recently. And but you know you can say Fitch, but you know they are basically uh, in a, a hurt locker if you want to put it that way with uh, it, you know with their financial situation in Russia because you know if the United States lost half the value, you know, the U.S. currency, the U.S. dollar lost half its value inside of less than a year, the way the ruble has been doing, um, you'd never hear the end of it from the proponents in the supposed alternative media. You know, they'd say the end is here. The end is, it may be that when things change and price, oil prices go way up, which I think they will, low oil prices, when they're too, too low, and it's stopping new ex oil exploration and new capital expenditures. It's going to lead to high oil prices. Now, the other thing is, there's another factor that's going on. But first, before I get into that, this is actually a little bit of an older graph. And you look at the red. The red is the U.S., right? That is, con see, it's a little bit of an older graph. This is not the situation today because of the shale oil industry. But it wasn't that many years ago that we were a major importer of oil. You look at Russia, they're in a the green. You look according to this chart, you know, they hardly in import any oil. Europe imp imports some oil. Canada imports less oil than, than Europe. And China imports less oil than uh, Europe even, I think, because I guess maybe, I don't know where, how they're getting it, but China and India are, are well, you know, wait a minute, excuse me, China and India are importing about the same as Europe, less oil than the uh, United States because they don't have uh, domestic consumption as much as the United States. And you look at Saudi and, uh, you know, um, Nigeria, Sudan, or whatever, they, they don't import oil. But, you know, part of that reason is because they don't have domestic consumption. See, even though the U.S. production is pretty close to the top of the, top of the world, like as far as production per barrel, uh, the number of barrels of crude oil that uh, is produced, the U.S. has an extremely high demand for oil domestically. So, in other words, in Russia, even though we're getting pretty close to what the Russian um, oil uh, production is, Russia does not have a very high internal demand for oil because there's actually a lot of people in Russia don't even drive a car. So, that's, you know, that's another reason. A lot of people don't realize that. But what I'm pointing out here is that 
as the shale oil industry is hurt so bad and some of it just goes under. Now, I know it's not going to go under where, you know, they already outlaid a lot of the capital expenditures. And in other words, all the work's done there. What I think is going to happen is a lot of the smaller producers are going to go under and get bought up by Wall Street. You know, just to use a phrase, Wall Street with the big bucks and be able to come in there and buy them for pennies on a dollar. But the thing is, it's not the production is not going to come back on full steam like turning on a spigot right away. It'll come on faster than if they had a, um, you know, start from scratch. But it won't just be turned on right away. So what could possibly happen is that once this, it's almost like a, a boomerang or a, a rubber band going in one direction and then stretching in the opposite direction, when we get to a certain price level, and this is probably partly what the Saudis are trying to do, but it's, there's a lot of different angles going on here because it's also in concert with what the administration's trying to do to punish Russia. They're trying to, um, you know, Saudis are looking at it from they want to actually knock out the U.S. oil industry. And when that happens, though, it's also going to create a financial crisis because of all the, the type of... Um, and junk bonds that are supporting the oil industry. That actually is going to be another financial crisis as in the same thing that happened with the real estate crisis which really set off the beginning of the last financial crisis in 2008. The first real estate crisis came first in 2007. So a lot of the debt that is um, that is held that investors hold on the oil industry is um, going to go under because of uh, these low oil prices. So there's a lot of different angles. And so, in other words, um, it, what could possibly happen is the United States, in, 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 in you know, it could start being a victim of imports again because of these prices, because the domestic depression, the uh, production going, is going to be going down. And part of that is, you know, you'll see because of all the layoffs, you'll see what's going on in the industry itself. So I'm saying is this is actually leading to another crisis. Now, this is actually a map of coal deposits in the USA. And we got plenty of coal. Actually, there's a new method that they can make gasoline from coal and I don't you know they say it's already in production it's not a theory they say it's already being done but it's not widely being done and they're saying that gasoline is a dollar seventy one a gallon by making it directly from coal and natural gas I don't you know I don't know how true this is or not but you know it's one of those supposedly you know I, I'm gleaming the best information I possibly can but I can't trust anything even I read no matter where how good the source is but they supposedly already have these methods but I want to bring up this point the current administration has put such a hurt on the US domestic coal industry through the EPA that this is not going to be a source of energy that we can readily tap into as a matter of fact, um, I think West Virginia, which is over here, which has a very large uh, coal production, um, you know, they got hurt greatly by the Obama administration over the last six years. And, you know, this is part of our energy independence, not just shale oil, but also coal. So it's kind of like we're going right back to where we were before the energy crisis of 1973 but my contention is we're not going to have a shortage where the pumps are going to run dry it's the price is going to be too high and unaffordable for most people to pay that's where we're leading to and the reason I'm saying that partly is like I really latched on to what Obama said I know you can say you don't trust him but I think he's really dropping a you know more than a dime there more than a hint it's a manhole cover, basically. He's telling you ahead of time. I know sometimes you might not want to believe it, but I'm telling you, he's telling you ahead of time. And it does make economic sense 
that low prices will lead to high prices and similarly on the opposite side extremely high prices will lead to demand destruction and collapse the industry the other way too because they'll find alternative methods there's going to be one more super super spike in oil left and you know after that we're probably going to be so you know once they really clobber the hell out of people's pocketbooks people probably will be on other alternative energy do or die one way or the other it may not be coal it'll probably be solar I don't know what else it could possibly be or some other high tech but we already know about solar and that's getting better and better so you know electricity is probably going to be the way to power vehicles and uh, heat houses so that may be an option now the other thing is what's been going on recently um, I mentioned this in some other videos and actually I mentioned the channel adapt 2030 uh, it also talks about the uh, you know the, the crop failures that are going to be coming up due to this which is going to lead to higher oil price I'm not trying to paint doom and gloom here but I'm trying to you know I know there's a lot of people on YouTube that just really dramatize the hell out of everything but being very realistic about this there is um, a lot more scientists now even kind of changing their tune about the global warming and saying we're going to global cooling and if you look back throughout history we we can even tell what the weather patterns are not just from ancient records but not exact temperature records but you know we could talk we could look in uh, records from France and things and say they were um, you know petitioning the king that they couldn't pay their taxes in grain because they used to pay taxes in grain uh, because the soil was frozen over and, they, and they, could, they couldn't plant the crop because of the ice. So you knew it was something was going on with the weather back then. But they could tell from the sediment in the ocean almost exactly what the temperatures were going back thousands of years because of the number of warm types of uh, plant, biological plant life or whatever lives in the ocean versus cold in the ratios. So they had a pretty good idea. They had a pretty damn good idea of what the temperatures were in the past. And it looks like we're going into a pattern of uh, solar cycles uh, the way it was 400 years ago. And this is just the beginning of it, whereby uh, we're going into like the way it was in the 1600s. And, you know, I mentioned before that actually in the 1600s, the uh, narrows between uh, Staten Island and New York used to freeze over for six weeks out of the year and people could walk across it. Now you saw last year Niagara Falls froze over, 2011 Niagara Falls froze over, the last time it froze over before that was 1911 and the time before that was in the late 1800s. So there's a lot of indications say you know you could say it's it gets warm, but you know, when it goes into global cooling, it does get warm and cold and it goes up and down. So this was in the UK. They've had some extraordinary cold weather. It's been going on, but you know what I'm pointing out about this is this is creating a lot more demand for oil. It's got to be. Home heating is a major slice of the pie. And you also have to remember that Germany and, well, Japan's closed down their... Um, nuclear facilities after Fukushima but Germany also followed suit and did did the same thing so when Japan closed down their f nuclear facilities they created a much bigger demand for um, fuel oil to heat and elect you know to get to, to um, you know to uh, manufacture electricity and so did Germany now Japan's also been experiencing extraordinary so snowfalls like they already received as much snow as they get in a whole year um, you know as of a couple weeks ago <laughs> almost the beginning of winter they've already got a whole winter's worth of snow like Sweden got two years worth of snow and before uh, January 1st they actually had to remove snow from ski slopes because the ski lifts uh, from the ski lifts because the ski lifts were actually hitting the snow when they're going up they were not high up in the air that's how deep the snow was they got two years worth of snow already. Now, um, also in South Dakota and the Bakken Oil Reserve area, it's been hitting, hit, getting hit heavy with lots of snow, which is, I know that it's got to be affecting oil production and the cost of oil production. Uh, just as another tidbit, 
Um, Switzerland, it was in January, just a few days ago, 15,000 people, 15,000, not 1,500, not 150, 15,000 people. Now, I'm not talking about a city. 15,000 people were stranded on a highways, high, a highway, a long stretch of highway through the Alps due to unprecedented or maybe extraordinary, maybe it was unprecedented, but extraordinary snowfall. One of them died so far because of, you know, the cold. Uh, so there's a lot, I mean, I can go on about the snowfall stuff for a long time, but if you want to look at ADAPT 2030, um, the channel, he goes in a lot more detail about it. But my point about this is that this is another extraordinary event that's occurring right now. And we're going into this colder and colder climate. In other words, if we think it's cold last year and it's colder this year by far. Next year is going to be even colder and colder and colder for the next 25 years that we're going into this 400-year cycle. And it's going to drastically um, put a burden on the system for, you know, oil production. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, that they lowered the price this low with oil by electronic means. Uh, which I think was basically to punish Russia in, co- in concert with, you know, the administration in Saudi and all that, to punish Russia. And probably, you know, there's a, there's probably a policy to bring down the um, um, industry anyway in the United States because I noticed the Obama administration is definitely not friendly to the coal industry at all in the U.S. They're, and they were not uh, friendly to the Keystone Pipeline. So, you know... You know, it's probably the the word is the watchword in the policy is sustainable development, where you know, energy is going to be taxed through a carbon tax. Mm, you know, so I think a lot of this stuff is leading to is being brought about because of other underlying policies that the globalists are pushing. So. This is actually when your silver is probably going to go up. You're going to need it. It's going to go up because at the same time, when it really spikes, it's going to be spiking around the same time that oil prices spike. Now, you can look at what's going on today, and you're thinking that's going to be a while away because of what the oil prices are today. Now, if something happens with the king of Saudi, you know, I don't know, all bets are off because that can change the political situation in the Middle East right away. But this is the game I'm talking about because when um, oil prices do spike because the demand destruction is not there in oil right now. Actually, this is creating a demand for oil right now with these low oil prices. It's probably going to kill our industry in the United States. And we're probably going to start going back to being a bigger, major oil importer. It's also going to hurt the tar sands up in Canada, that industry. But I'm guessing, I'll tell you this, I'm guessing that the weather is a curveball that's being thrown at the plans of the elite who are actually manipulating this policy right now because... You know, there's absolutely no reason why the oil prices should have just dropped off the cliff. And it, it's really due to um, either they're trying to manipulate or punish Russia financially. I know that's 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 actually what's happening. But they may be trying to push Russia into a confrontation, too. They might be. And if you look back in... The causes of the real causes of World War II, and you know, I noticed like not every, not everybody, nobody's a saint. No matter what side you pick, I know like the alternative media makes it look like Putin's a saint, and I'm like he's not a saint. And I know the alternative media makes it look like they'll make it look like the Nazis are the saint. You know, they'll even do that sometimes. You know, I mean, um, there was probably some things in the 30s before they went to war. Uh, when they provided more vacations for the workers and stuff, there was there was bright elements within it, you know. But that's that's how it is with everything, right? I mean, everything that is even has a lot of bad to it sometimes has little silver linings, right? 
But, you know, the alternative media, God, they, they just go off on a tangent to the max with many things. Um, and But, you know, it's like we got evil over here in our elite, and they got evil over there in their elite on the other side of the world. Now, let me put it to you this way. You know, nobody on the other side of the world, I, mean, I, I just got to tell you this because this really burns me sometimes where people think, that Putin is going to save us on this side of the world and is against the new world order. He's not. He's not. He's not. Because uh, he's part of the game. He's a different part of the game. He's a different facet of the game. i got to mention this because, you know, if you are an American, you believe in freedom. You believe in freedom as an individual. You believe in freedom for your individual other fellow Americans or individuals. And we do not do this through worshiping a leader if you need a dictator to make things right for you you just gave up all your freedoms so that's why I don't like it when people get behind any kind of leader you know screaming about Obama Romney you know he's the good guy this Putin's the good guy Bush the good guy somebody will tell you I don't know even Ron Paul I mean you know if you gotta if you gotta have a leader to fix all your problems, you gave up your freedoms, you know? Now, I'm showing Jesus saves here. Maybe that's your leader, too. But, you know, I just look at it like common sense, you know? Just work your ass off and uh, think smart. Think smart, too. Um, but just be prepared because Obama actually is dropping us a major hint. i got to reiterate that. I forgot where I read that, too. It was in, it was in a major media, though. Uh, but it was something he was saying that people should not just enjoy these oil prices that we have right now, but they'll have a little more money to spend. Make sure that you buy something with that money that you are not spending on oil or oil, higher oil prices because you got low, you got a little extra money because you have, you're not spending as much on fuel or home heating to buy something. That will last you some years. He's actually warning that. And if you just go into one-on-one economics, high oil prices lead to low oil prices, but lead to demand destruction. And on a flip side, too low of commodity prices actually leads to high prices because there's no uh, incentive to spend um, to do capital expenditures for more exploration. And once the cheap stuff is gone or it's getting more depleted, then when they, it's a mad rush to get um, get production going again, and you just can't turn on the spigots. But the other side of it is this. There's Let me put it this way. There's a very, very low correlation between the price of oil and gold and um, silver. There's a fairly decent correlation between the price of gold and oil but when oil goes into a radical super spike that's when the correlation between oil and gold and silver gets very tight that's why I talk about when they kind of do run in a very general way they do run together at certain times especially especially when oil super spikes so all this um, low oil prices is going to lead to, well, it already is leading, it already has started, um, you know, a lack of capital expenditure for new exploration. It's going to lead to shortages. Low oil prices is going to lead to shortages. It's not going to lead to, sorry, no gas, but it's going to lead to, sorry, the price is going to be extraordinarily high. But your silver should be very high at that time, too. If you look back when we had the war with um, Gaddafi, I know it wasn't, I don't want to get into the politics on that, but only 1% of the oil was taken off the market. Oil went up to 120 a barrel. That was also the time when gold and silver was flying through the roof of platinum and palladium. If you look back during the Iranian hostage crisis, which, you know, happened after 73, that happened in 79, right? That was during a time, I know it wasn't just that due to that, but usually very high tensions in the Middle East 
is one of the major factors that leads to very high oil prices. But, you know, we also have the weather factor coming on our side, too. So, eventually, this is actually going to put a major hurt on the middle class unless they are prepared for it. And, you know, part of the preparation is not just silver, but also um, other methods to use energy. And uh, so, anyway, I think I covered a lot on this, but I just want to point out that it is reality. It's not a drama story. The cycles and ups and downs in commodities can get pretty crazy. It's like, you know, when things are going up, people are screaming it's going to go to the moon. It actually creates demand destruction, and they find alternative methods or ways around it. If you remember back in 73, you had these big giant Cadillacs, and what happened, that created a demand for Japanese import cars that were efficient. That some, at the time, actually, some of those cars without the airbags in the early, early 70s, they actually did get 50 miles per gallon because they're very light. They're very lightweight cars, but not, you know, didn't have all the power windows and all the insulation. They were just efficient uh, cars that ran very cheaply on gasoline. But so people started using less gasoline for that reason. They just went into another type of vehicle. Now, this time, it could be electric vehicles or hybrids. But that's going to be mainly the people that have the money to buy thirty, forty thousand dollar, $50,000 electric vehicles. You know, they're getting up. They're not, they're not going to be filtered down into everybody's going to be able to buy them until maybe they start selling them two or three years old second hand. So in the meantime, the middle class is going to be stuck paying the prices for the gasoline. So it's going to create... Um, not so much a lack of fuel, but an unaffordable, an unaffordable fuel. And this is going to lead to uh, a major energy crisis and the destruction of the middle class if they're not totally prepared. Now, um, this is in addition to, I know there's a lot of stuff going on with the uh, debt and all this type of stuff and Obamacare, but I think this point I'm illustrating here is uh, I'm trying to put it in such a way that it's reality, not drama. It's it's a cycle of economics that always happens. And I'm not trying to beat the drums of, oh, the sky is falling. And I, I'm so sick of those yo-yos out there because that's, that's all they do. I'm trying to paint you a picture of true reality. Now, I know the situation could have been, with commodities, could have been at any time they could go up if there's a conflict in the Middle East. That is true, but you know what's going on today with these two low oil prices, capital expenditures are non-existent for new oil exploration. Shale oil industry is going down. The tar sands is being hurt very bad. Russia is being hurt very bad. Venezuela is, Venezuela is on the ropes even. Uh, offshore exploration is, is going down. You know, I mean, they're not, they're just not going to get new oil at these oil prices until the prices go back up. And they will go back up because Saudi, by itself, is not going to be able to pump the entire world's supply of oil for so long, especially what's going on with these extraordinary cold weather events that we're seeing across the world, the globe this year. Now, I don't expect oil prices to go up right away a lot it probably might take 2015 or maybe maybe later into 2015 but do remember we're going into global cooling if it's an extraordinarily cold winter this year it's going to be colder next year and the year after and until they actually use different technology you're going to see a major problem with oil prices going way to hell up way to hell up and that's when your cedar silver go up. So uh, it's there's a lot of factors that are actually probably not even on the radar of the elite, and I think the weather is one of them because they are so concentrated on this global warming garbage that um, I don't think they really have it all figured out. To tell you the truth, I don't think they do. So we shall see. Uh, and hopefully these predictions I'm giving you are going to be giving you today 
are, well, I'm not hopefully, but I think they're going to be 100% accurate. It's not going to be something that's going to happen in a week or a month, though. So just keep that in mind.